Thank you very much. Um, at the outset, I wish to thank the organizers of the Morum Lectures and the administration at Fazil Ali College for their generous invitation for me to speak at the 19th Morum Lecture. The Morum Lecture series has drawn together a formidable array of scholars and public intellectuals who have contributed greatly to Naga public discourse. Finding myself among them indeed is a great honor, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Iwati Inchin for his generous hospitality and for bringing me here all the way. I will also readily admit that I said yes to this talk because, the because of the location, and it was Fazil Ali College, uh, and not online. Most meetings are conducted online nowadays, and I really believe in reducing my carbon footprint, so I would have been glad to do it, but this was a chance I couldn't miss, and it's a, this invitation is very, very significant for me, so I'm grateful that my friends at Morum have taken so much care to bring me here in person. One of the things that I've been reflecting upon since Akangla asked me to deliver the ninth Morum lecture last month is the extent of the debt uh, that I owe to my Naga friends and family. I hope to explain this in greater detail in the next four minutes that I have left with me. Um, this talk actually emerged out of conversations, uh, discussions, debates, disagreements with a lot of younger scholars who come to Tata Institute of Social Sciences, many of them from the, the Northeast. Uh, and I realized that a lot of them were either very embarrassed about the fact that their ancestors and their forebearers hadn't done enough uh, and that they were quote unquote not developed enough, the region itself, um, and therefore felt a little shy about talking about their past. Or on the other hand, uh, they were very, very stubbornly almost um, proud of places that they had come from to the extent that they didn't want to even consider other possibilities where their uh, their histories might have coincided or had, might have had borrowed from other neighbors in, the mean, in, in its development, something that we can see to very terrible effect today in Manipur. My talk today is divided into two parts. In the first part, I wish to share with you some of my personal history that constantly remind me of the presence of Nagas in my life. This personal history, I feel, cannot be disconnected from the larger history of the Assamese people especially in Upper Assam. It could also serve as a reminder of how places and people have shaped politics in our region. The second part of the talk is about the impact and implications of history in defining our nostalgia and nationalist worlds in the 21st century. The first section of my talk today is called Personal Connections and Social History. I was born 50 years ago, not very far from Mokokchung. Both my sister, who preceded me into this world by five years, and I were birthed at the Christian Mission Hospital on Jail Road in the small town of Jorhat. My mother's house was barely two kilometers away towards the Roria Airport, though she and my father lived in his village Kenduguri that was several kilometers to the east of the Christian Mission Hospital. In those days, the village was not considered to be part of the town. The doctor who was responsible for helping deliver me into the world was called Dr. Goldsmith. He too was from near Jorhat, from one of the pioneering Christian families, and was said to be a descendant of Godula Brown. Like most children who are curious about their moment of birth, I often ask my mother who was around when I was born and what were they doing. My father was there, she, she reassured me. A beautiful and kind Naga nurse bundled me in flannel cloth and handed me over to my father and other waiting relatives on a cold winter morning she would go on. Back then, there was no way of knowing that I was born almost 100 years after the American missionary Reverend Edward Clark and his Assamese friend, uh, Godhula Brown, had preached the gospel to spread the word of Christ in Molungkim Nong village. Some of us here would also remember that Molungkim Nong Kimon was the home of Supong Merin, who was friends with both Gorula Brown and Reverend Edward Clark. Naga philosopher Dr. Asang Basudir wrote poignantly about this unique friendship between the three. In his essay written for the online journal The Naga Republic, he cited from Clark's letters and described how Supong Merin and his kinsmen would be fascinated by the sight of children studying in schools in the valley 
whenever they made their trips down the mountain to trade. Six years after I was born, I would leave to join a boarding school in Shillong. There, perhaps for the first time in my life, I would taste the eye-popping, rapid breath, breath intaking and utterly delicious mix of ground meat and chilies that my Naga friends brought from their homes. They would describe the beauty of their homes as I would try to explain the monotonous life that I lived in the tea plantations of Assam. It was through this exchange of food and stories that I got interested in my own history and by extension, the place of my birth. Jorhat was the last capital of the Ahom Kingdom that was established in 1794. Some radicals in Assam refer to it as the last capital of independent Assam, as if the Ahom Kingdom was homologous to the modern state of Assam. I have a reason for inv invoking this pre-colonial history. Many of us, especially those who live in the borders between the two states, acknowledge the period as one that was both fueled by conflict but also fostered ties of kinship and solidarity. The relationships of solidarity were built on trust and diplomacy. One such example was the creation of the third and last category of high councillors of the Ahom Kingdom. In the 16th century, King Suhung Mung Dehingya Roja inducted the Naga warrior Konseng as the first Borpatra Guhai, or the third councillor of the kingdom. The councillors of the Ahom Kingdom wielded enormous power, so the other two, the Buragohai and the Borgohai, were opposed to the creation of a new office with whom they had to share power. The king persevered and claimed that Kongsen was, Kongseng was his half-brother. Since the two other councillors refused to part with their militia, the king transferred part of the non-Ahom militia under his control to the Borpatra Gohai. Thereafter, in times of war and during natural calamity, the Burongis tell us that it was the house of the Borpatra Gohai that would save ordinary subjects in the kingdom. In return, they were granted lands and labor in several places across what is now Upper Assam, including the modern towns of Hibohagor, Amguri, Jorhat, and Golaga. Hence, it is not surprising that many revivalists in Assam and practical-minded political theorists across Upper Assam often invoke these stories in times of crisis. There are very few descriptions of pre-modern Jorhat, but the modern city was built in 1839 around some old landmarks that exist up to this day. Gor Ali, or the Fortress Road, was constructed parallel to the Desoy River in a north-south direction in the, late 19th, in the late 18th century. It served to protect the king's palace as well as the house of the nobles from the river and the Muammaria rebels who were constantly attacking the capital from the east. My grandmother said that in its time, the fortress road stretched from the northern edge of town near Horbai Bondha to near Doklongya along the foothills in the south. Inside the safety of its ramparts were places like Mithapukri that is home to my friend and fellow resident of Jorhat, Mirza Zulfikar Rahman. Mirza once told me that the name Mithapukri was bestowed upon the place centuries ago by visiting Naga traders who would sit under the shade of the many gooseberry trees that ring the freshwater community pond. As they drank the sour fruit and drank from the as they ate the sour fruit and drank from the water up from the pond, the tastes in the mouths were transformed, hence the name Mithapukri. In 1839, the British, who by then had colonized much of Upper Assam in search of tea, set up a police outpost, uh, outpost and a few decades later, a town grew around it. All the paraphernalia of, an, of a European settler town, which is a jail, a courthouse, the district magistrate's office, as well as a commercial block, came up around the last quarter of the 19th century. Many of the establishment was set up to facilitate the tea industry. Hence, there was a colonial club with a golf course and a polo ground, scores of tea plantations that had palatial bungalows, colonies for the emerging Assamese elite who had invested in the tea industry, modern schools and colleges. The hospital where I was born came up around that time. In almost the same year, in almost the same year when all these establishments were being set up, Jorhat saw the establishment of the Toklai Tea Research Association on the banks of the Toklai River. However, there were also other cultural, cultural and educational institutions that evolved towards the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries, 
and they continue to be landmarks in Jorhat today. The Eastern Theological College was set up by the American Baptists, first in Naugao, and then to its current location by the banks of the Toklai River in Jorhat. The industrious works of Reverend S.A. Boggs and, Hen and Reverend Henry Goldsmith resulted in the creation of a vibrant group of schools, including a Bible school, a high school, and an industrial school that has now been converted by the government of Assam to the Industrial Training Institute. These developments brought together different communities to our small town. Bengali shopkeepers jostles for, jostles for space in the markets with Marwari traders, while Sikh Punjabi engineers set up their workshops next to Anglo-Indian railway workers. Young Naga people, especially from the villages in what is now Mukukchung district, also found their way to Jorhat, sometimes due to pressing differences with traditional elders in their villages. One of Fazal Ali College's illustrious alum alumna, Professor Temsula Ao, wrote a biographical book about a personal story that, ex that exemplified what I'm talking about. The book titled Once Upon a Life, Burnt Curry and Bloody Rags, a memoir, spoke about her birth in the mission hospital in Jorhat, where her father had taken his young wife and growing family from their ancestral village in Chanki. However, barely had her youngest sibling been born, both her parents died in less than a year from each other. That left her under the guardianship of her elder brother, who was given, the, who was given a job by the management of the Christian Mission Hospital. Uh, then, she writes in her book, once her older brother was appointed as the assistant teacher in the ancestral village in Chanki, she returned with him to stay on until it was time for her to find a school. That school happened to be Christian High School in Golaghat, which was then known as the Oval Swanson Mission Girls School. It was set up by the American Women's Foreign Mission Society, who first toyed the idea of starting it near Anguri, but finally decided to stick with Golaghat, since it had a sizable Christian population, as well as motorable roads and a railhead nearby. Auntie Temsler's powerful book of short stories, These Hills Called Home, uh, had a story that I imagine was her own, about a little girl and her stoic elder, older brother traveling for two days from the village in Chan Chanki to get to her school in Golaghat. The kindness of people along the way was juxtaposed with the sadness of an older sibling living, leaving a younger one at the closed gates of a school on a dark, cold winter night. My mother-in-law and Auntie Temsler were schoolmates. Oh, what are the chances that you married Marlowe's youngest daughter? She chuckled more than 20 years ago when I told her I had gotten married. I had married before registering for my PhD at Nehu, where her home was always a welcoming one in the otherwise strange new, strange new campus at Umshing Mokin Rock. Both she and my mother-in-law would regale, would regale me with stories about how the Naga girls from the hostel would request their Assamese friends who lived nearby to play the radio loud or the record player on full volume, especially when Bhupen Hazarika was on. I mentioned these two books for a reason. I had gifted Once Upon a Life to my father about 10 years ago. I felt he was looking for something fami for some familiar memories to relive him of the dull ache of having lost my mother a few years before. The book seemed to revive him. He read it several times and then drove across to my uncle's house that was just a stone's throw from the mission hospital to pass on the book. My uncle read the book and he called me excitedly. She has described our Jorha just as it was so many years ago, he exclaimed excitedly. Very soon, that book was passed around from one passed around to, to other septuagenarians, people who are above 70, all over Jorhat, as though it was an unofficial book club of retirees. We should get her over and host her for a week, my uncle suggested. I promised to put the word out to Auntie Temsler, but by then she had retired from Nehu and had taken on responsibilities as, a, as the chairperson of the Women's Commission for the Government of Nagaland. Her book, these Hills Called Home, the second book, is one that I make all my students read so that they can understand the effects of militarization of this region. Allow me to mention one more luminary as I speak of the deep connections um, that weld the history of Upper Assam and the Naga ancestral homeland. One of the most celebrated footballers of his time, Dr. Talimiran Ao, 
was a schoolboy and captain of the football team in the Jorhat Mission High School, after which he went to Cotton College in Guwahati. He later on to went on to complete his medical degree from Assam Medical College in Dibruga. The past pupil and alumni of Cotton College now, which is now called Cotton University, have named their only indoor stadium after him. Besides the well-known personalities who have their connections with, with Upper Assam, I would also like to remind my audience that the strength of our associations come from extraordinary affection of ordinary people. Whenever I meet an older male relative from my partner's side of the family, we say our prayers and read verses from the Bible in Assamese written in the Roman script. Many of them had studied theology in Assam and felt more comfortable conversing and reminiscing in an accent that I would like to claim as an Upper Assam one. There are also tragic reminders that come up from time to time. One of the victims of the Oting massacre that happened on 4th December 2021 was a young Ahum boy called Bipul Kumar. I don't know where he was born or who his parents were, but today he lies and rests with his Naga brothers in Oting. With this, I would like to transition to the second part of my talk and focus on the impact and implications of history in defining our nationalist worlds in the 21st century. I call this section Nationalism, Nostalgia and History. In 2009, my partner and I moved back to Jorhat so we could be closer to my father as my mother had passed away. My partner, who was then a PhD student, had to do more than a, more than a year of fieldwork along the Assam Nagaland border region. It was a fraught time for us since the peace negotiations between the United Liberation, Liberation Front of Assam, or Alpha, and the government of India, that was mediated by the People's Consultative Group, had stuttered to a halt. The convener of the PCG, well-known human rights activist Lachit Bordoloi, had been sent to jail on far-fetched far charges of wanting to hijack an aircraft from Guwahati to Kathmandu. He was a friend and mentor to both my partner and I, so his arrest and continued incarceration had been particularly hard for us to process. Our lives in Jorhat were circumscribed by visits to relatives and work. To, to make matters worse, border clashes between various groups of people in Assam and Nagaland had begun to increase, making us nervous about my wife's long trips, long fieldwork trips away from home. Every time an incident happened at the border, small crowds of angry men would gather outside ETC in Jorhat and shout slogans <coughs> against Nagas. The vice principal, who was related to my partner, would often officiate in the absence of the principal and he had the difficult task of calling the police. It pained him as both he and his wife had lived in Jorhat for decades. Their children were born and grew up in the town where they had more friends than in Nagaland. The family and others on campus had accepted my partner and I since we were regulars in the Sunday service and we participated in the social and cultural events. So it was very embarrassing for us to have to, to, have to listen to anxious students, teachers and the vice principal when such potentially violent incidents happened outside their gates. And they did occur with alarming regularity. Something had happened to the Jorhat of my youth. When we were growing up in the 1980s and early 1990s, anger was, most expressed, was mostly expressed against the government and seldom against other communities in our small cosmopolitan little town. Unlike us, the young men who were noisily shouting slogans against Nagas outside ETC in 2009 and 2010 were the products of a city that had come undone in its resistance to regeneration. Paradoxically, the first few years of peace and a slow end of counterinsurgency campaigns against Alpha had coincided with the implosion of the tea industry in Upper Assam. The extractive industries of Upper Assam had continued their work. Only this time, their contractors were local young men who just a few years ago had seen the oil, coal and tea industry as examples of colonial exploitation. With the disappearing jobs and no promise of a future, young people had begun to turn on each other. There was a weird juxtaposition of civic pride and often grim reality. Jorhat was trying to be upwardly mobile in 2010. There was a new stadium, a brand new set of tennis courts and a better swimming pool. But at the same time, there was a backlash 
over plans to build a campus of the National Institute of Design on part of the Toklai Experimental Station tea plantation near the Agriculture University. It seemed a perfect recipe for conflict. Only this time, those guarding the grievances seemed to re reinforce the revelatory words of Martinican political philosopher Franz Fanon, who said, and I quote him, the colonized subject is a persecuted man who is forever dreaming of becoming a persecutor, unquote. In 2010, those guiding the anger against institutions like ETC simply because it had Naga students and teachers were like Fanon's description of colonized subjects who were confused by the many signs of the colonized world that seeped away their confidence. So instead of challenging the inequalities of the colonized world, they chose to stand in in place of the colonizer. One of the reasons I believe this happened has to do with the changing accent of nationalism in Assam and I dare say in the Naga ancestral territories as well. Until the 1990s, the unchanging questions that animated nationalist, nationalist struggles in our region was about land, who controlled its wealth producing capacities and who were the people being forced out of their share of the wealth accrued from land. By 2010, there had been a transformation of the insurgencies that had begun in the last quarter of the 20th century. The state's ability to engage with sections of the armed groups by bringing a few to the negotiating table and offering them a spectrum of economic and political options to leave arms, while continuing to militarize other obvious sites, other less obvious sites uh, of civic life, had resulted in the creation of a particularly interesting milieu. For instance, the, the presence of the army in rural Assam had become less pronounced than it was earlier, especially between 1990 and 2006. However, this did not lead to greater dialogue about what had transpired during the most brutal years of counterinsurgency. Instead, the theater of conflict moved to other spaces, most significantly to ideas of development that involved the state's tendency to engage experts, assess revenue-making capacities of natural resources, and clamp down on dissenting voices. The conflicts over land and resources did not find a place in reconciliatory dialogue and were instead subject, subjected to greater coercion by various parliamentary political parties. Civic protests and campaigns against the proposed big dams at Arunachal, as well as eviction of peasants from government land, are examples of this process. What this meant for poor people, Nagas, Assamese, Adivasis, Biharis, that lived in the border between the federal states of Assam and Nagaland, was more competition over scarce resources. In the time when Auntie Temsler left Chanki in the winter to attend her school in Golahat, her journey was made possible because of the foresight and fearlessness of her brother, as well as the kindness and generosity of the people she met along the way. The Mahajan in Marioni allowed her and her group from Chanki village to sleep in the shed in his, on his compound, where he arranged for wood and utensils for them to cook and eat. Amiable car owners, mostly Europeans, ferried her and her brother from Furkating to Golaghat in the middle of the night in their vehicles. Our times, our times have been harsher for their poverty of imaginations as well as the lack of generosity of the human spirit. In the hollowing out of solidarity and compassion, we have been left with inchoate anger and misplaced, stubborn, and misplaced stubbornness to allow the wind of change to clean the stale air of complacency. Many of you in the audience will recognize the pushback to new ideas, the fear of moving out of comfortable places. This is typical of a nostalgia that is associated with certain kinds of nationalist ideologies. Today, as Ugandan political anthropologist Mahmoud Mamdani reminds us, we are living through an era of civil wars and genocide, both of which are occurring in former colonial countries. He reminds us that there have been more conflicts after independence than in the colonial era. He also reiterates that the violence has not focused on the social question, that is to say, that the poor and oppressed social classes have not revolted against the rich. Thirteen years ago, I was asked to speak to a rather large audience comprising students, advocacy groups, young journalists and other members of civil society in Imphal. 
The occasion was the Arambam Somorendra Memorial Lecture that was held each year to commemorate the life and works of Arambam Somorendra. For those of you who don't know, he was one of the founders of the United Lab Liberation, National Liberation Front, UNLF, but more importantly, also a playwright and theatre artist who had translated classical Greek drama to his native Maitilon. Back then, I was optimistic enough and ended my talk with great hope that those who seek to divide indigenous people of the Northeast do not know the depth of solidarity and affection that we share. The events in Manipur over the last three months have taught me a lesson in humility, but it has also reminded all of us of the persuasive powers of a very base, hollow and dangerous appeal to amplify prejudice in times of crisis. To recognize this is to deepen our understanding of the political challenges faced by our forebearers during independence. It is to acknowledge that the political effect of colonialism was not limited to the loss of external independence, but also to boundaries that we grew inside our collective conscience. I feel that at the same time that I referred uh, at the same time that I referred to in the first part uh, of the talk, our, forebear our forebearers were not instrumentalizing culture for the purpose of dominating others. They were learning, helping, and most importantly, growing with one another. I would like to draw my talk to a close with an innocuous, probably innocuous story about rest and friendship. It involves Naga, it involves Naga nationalist leaders from the Naga National Council and local community leaders in Jorhat. In the year 2018, I had the good fortune to spend some time with an old NNC leader who had been elected to the post of Tatar in the NNC government way back in 1965. We were drinking tea at his house that was on the way to Kohima and he was a little hard of hearing. In 1966, I was told, that was the year when he was asked to be a member of the peace talks between the government of India and the federal government of Nagaland. 1966, for those of you who do history will remember, was when Mrs. Indira Gandhi had just been elected for the first time as the Prime Minister. Um, the leader that I was speaking to was a member of the team along with Naga national leader Kugato Sukhai, and they had to be transported from their mobile headquarters in Naga territory to New Delhi to meet with the then newly elected Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. They were first brought to Jorhat from where they caught the flight to Calcutta. At Jorhat, the retired Tata said that they met with some old friends who gave them food. More than 50 years since the meeting, he remembered the taste of the food, saying that they were glad for the offering of a home-cooked meal. I asked what they talked about, and he mistook my question to mean the political discussions in Delhi. We got stuck on definitions of sovereignty, he said, chuckling to himself. Mrs. Gandhi was giving us examples from Russia, America and other places until in the end we had to stop her and say that we were not there for lessons in law, he went on to explain. One of my companions corrected him and put out my original question to him again. He was asking about your conversations in Jorhat, my friend said, raising his voice so that he could be heard by the elder who had finished his tea by then. The retired Tatar smiled and said that they spoke about family and old friends in each other's homes. They spoke of matters of the heart. Our ancestors went very far from their comfort zones. In doing so, they discovered the joys of this beautiful land and the history of its people. Ironically, for a part of the time when they made their journeys, our destinies were controlled by people who were from across the sea. Yet the years of colonization did not prevent them from expanding their horizons. I mean our ancestors. In doing so, they spread the stories of their homes and places as well as homes elsewhere too. Jorhat, I would like to think, is also a Naga town, where at one time our political visions were broad enough to suspend nitpicking at definitions and concentrate on matters of the heart instead. Today, we are struggling in our post-colonial journeys. Our destinies through seemingly our own, though seemingly our own, are being shaped by people with narrower visions than the ones that our ancestors had bequeathed us. Let me leave you with a poem, and it's a slightly long poem, uh, that captures our predic predicament than my, than, better than my dry, tired words. It was written by my well, third favorite poet, William Butler Yeats, and it's, and it's entitled, uh, 
and it's titled, sorry, To Ireland in the Coming Times. We could substitute Ireland for Nagaland, Assam, whatever we want. This is the poem. Know that I would be a, that I would account it be true brother of a company that sang to sweeten Ireland's wrong. Ballad and story ran in song. Nor be I any less of them because the red rose bordered hen of her whose history began before God made the angelic clan. Trails all about the written page when time began to rant and rage. The measure of her flying feet made Ireland's heart begin to beat and time bade all his candles flare to, to light a measure here and there. And may the thoughts of Ireland's brood upon a measured quietude. Nor may I less be counted one with Davis, Mangan, Ferguson, because to him who ponders well my rhymes more than their rhyming tell of things discovered in the deep where only bodies laid sleep. For the elemental creatures go about my table to and fro that hurry from unmeasured mind to rant and rage in flood and wind. Yet he who treads in measured ways may surely barter gaze for gaze. Man ever journeys on with them after the red rose bordered hem. Ah, fairies dancing under the moon, a druid land, a druid tune. While I still may, I write for you. The love I lived, the dream I knew. From our birthday until we die, is but the winking of an eye. And we are singing in our love, what measure of time has lit above. And all benighted things that go about, about my table to and fro are passing on where may be, in truth's consuming ecstasy. No place for love and dream at all, for God goes by with white footfall. I cast my heart into my rhymes, that you, in dim coming times, may know, that, may know how my heart went with them, after the red rose bordered heaven. Thank you.